This is the second video that I have made on Costan Alamariu's thesis, Selective Breeding and the Birth of Philosophy. If you haven't watched the first video, I suggest you click this link. If you would like to support the work that I do, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and Patreon. Thank you. In 399 BC, Socrates was put to death by the Athenians. No other trial, except that of Jesus, has left so vivid an impression on the imagination of Western man. The father of Western philosophy had been killed by his own people. Why? Why did the Athenians decide to kill Socrates? Typically, people view the trial of Socrates as a witch hunt. They believe that Socrates was executed for critiquing religion. There is some truth to this view. It is not, however, the full story. In his thesis, Selective Breeding and the Birth of Philosophy, Costin argues that the trial and execution of Socrates can be attributed to his association with tyranny and tyrants. In other words, the democratic Athenians killed Socrates for promoting tyranny. To understand this idea, we must briefly discuss the historical context in which Socrates lived. Ancient Greece was not a unified nation, but a collection of competing city-states that frequently went to war with one another. These competing city-states had distinct forms of governance. Today, we still use Greek words to describe these distinct forms of governance. The words democracy, tyranny, oligarchy, and aristocracy are all Greek in origin. Then, as now, ideological differences led to conflict and war. Tyrants would often come into conflict with aristocrats. Democrats would come into conflict with oligarchs. This conflict did not just occur between city-states. It also occurred within city-states. Within each city-state, there was recurrent strife between democrats, aristocrats, and oligarchs. These ideological rivals competed for power in the city. When one faction seized power, they would often kill their ideological rivals and take their property. These competing factions sought support from their ideological allies in other Greek cities. Athens funded and supported Democrats in cities under Spartan rule. Meanwhile, Athenian anti-Democrats received financial and military support from Sparta. In Athens, aristocratic clubs were established. According to Aristotle, members of one aristocratic club in Athens took an oath where they said, I will be an enemy to the people and will devise all the harm I can against them. These clubs played an important role in Athenian politics. They often conspired to overthrow the Athenian democracy. On two separate occasions, the anti-democrats in Athens were able to seize power. This was done in 411 BC and in 404 BC. On both occasions, the anti-democratic faction was able to overthrow the democracy and set up a dictatorship. On both occasions, the anti-democratic faction worked hand in glove with Sparta. The events of 404 BC are particularly relevant to our discussion. In that year, a man named Critias led the anti-democratic faction against the democracy. After seizing power, he launched a reign of terror in which hundreds of Athenians were executed, murdered, and exiled. Aristotle claims that 1,500 Athenians were executed without trial. This event, in and of itself, was not that unique. As I said a moment ago, competing political factions in ancient Greece often seized power and killed their political rivals. What was unique was the ideas that Critias was motivated by. Indeed, Critias was a political philosopher who had become a tyrant. Critias believed that morality, custom, and religion were created by weak men to enslave strong men. In a state of nature, strong men rule. But through religion, laws, and morality, the weak are able to triumph over the strong. Critias believed that this was a violation of the natural order. In other words, he believed that nature should triumph over custom, that the strong should triumph over the weak. He believed that the strong man should be like a lion, doing whatever it wants, regardless of what others think. This is why he slayed the priests. It's why he exiled and executed the Democrats. 
This is how Coston describes this event at the beginning of his thesis. Critias was the Hitler of the ancient Greek world. He and his friends established a regime based on atheistic biologism, so to speak. On Sparta radicalized, a eugenic antinomian dictatorship. He was maybe what Hitler's most hysterical detractors claim of him today. Critias killed more Athenians in his short rule then died in the decades of the war with Sparta. He expelled almost everyone from the city and burned the docks, which were the perceived source of democratic power. He wasted all the priests for being tedious religious moralists. He saw the purpose of the Spartan constitution as the creation of one supreme biological specimen, and Critias sought to found a state based on such ideas. What does this have to do with Socrates? How are the events that I just described relevant to him? Well, Socrates taught Critias, and Critias was Plato's uncle. Both Socrates and Plato were outspoken critics of democracy, and many members of their philosophical circle promoted an amoral antinomian philosophy that suggested that might equals right. This leads one to wonder, what role did Socrates play in the rise of Critias? Furthermore, what was the relationship between philosophers and tyrants? These questions will be explored in this video. In my last episode on selective breeding and the birth of philosophy, I spoke about the distinction between nature and convention. The things made by man are conventional. The things not made by man are natural. Burial rites, dress codes, and religious practices are made by man. Blood, soil, and waterfalls are not. Today, the distinction between nature and convention is recognized by most people, but Coston argues that this was not always the case. The idea of nature has been alien to most people throughout most of human history. This is because custom, convention, and unwritten law have been seen as natural. Just as the sun sets, the tribe avoids certain foods. Just as the bird flies, the tribe has certain tattoos. Natural events, such as rainfall, are not separate from custom. Quite the opposite. They are actually determined by custom and rituals. If the elder does not dance, the rain will not fall. In short, convention and nature have been inextricably intertwined in the minds of most people throughout most of human history. The first group of people who began to understand that there was something distinct from custom and convention were the pastoralists. The chief occupation of the pastoralists was the breeding of livestock. They realized that certain traits, behaviors, and tendencies could be passed down from one animal to another through breeding. You could make a horse faster, not by training it, but through selective breeding. Coston argues that the ancient Greeks were the first group of people to actually articulate what the pastoralists had known on a practical level. They were themselves animal breeders. The selective breeding of sporting and ornamental animals was one of the characteristic hobbies of Athenian gentlemen. Plato's brother was an enthusiastic breeder of animals. Plato's stepfather was renowned for breeding beautiful peacocks. Xenophon, who was one of Socrates' students, wrote a book about how to breed hunting dogs. In short, ancient Greek aristocrats understood that certain traits could be passed down from one animal to another through selective breeding. Like their pastoralist ancestors, they knew the difference between nature and nurture. But unlike their pastoralist ancestors, they were able to abstract, articulate, and intellectualize this idea. To quote Coston, the momentous discovery of nature, the precondition for both philosophy and science, is the preserve of one very unusual people, the ancient Greeks. In ancient Greece, philosophy encompassed science. They were not two separate fields, but inextricably intertwined. The philosopher studied the natural world. In other words, he studied the things not made by man. The stars, anatomy, and human biology were studied by ancient philosophers. The names of these men are remembered till this day. Men like Anaxagoras, Hippocrates, 
and Thales. They were all obsessed with nature, the things not made by man. The discovery of nature and the subsequent study of it also led to a debate among the Greeks. Indeed, the nature versus nurture debate began in ancient Greece. Greek philosophers debated the difference between nature and nurture, or, to use their words, physis and nomos. To what extent was intelligence the product of education? Was a great fighter born or made? All these questions, and more, were debated in ancient Greece. This debate was not merely intellectual, it had real-world implications for Greek life. When the Greeks realized that breeding played a central role in the formation of the individual, they began to introduce eugenic provisions. The Spartans, for example, presented their newborn children before a state council of inspectors. Children, deemed ugly or defective, were cast from a cliff to meet their fate on the jagged rocks below. Meanwhile, in Athens, both law and public opinion allowed a father to terminate the life of a newborn child if it was considered weak or deformed. In both Athens and Sparta, the Greeks exposed their infants to extreme weather conditions to toughen them. The Greeks did this because they believed it would improve them in much the same way it improved their animals. In addition to debating the role that nature and nurture played in character formation, the Greeks also debated the conflict between nature and convention. Should life be lived in harmony with nature, or should it be lived in accordance with religious principle? Should we listen to the priests or the call of the wild? Was life superior within the confines of the city or outside of it? All these questions were debated by the Greeks. It should come as no surprise that there was a political dimension to this debate. The democratic Greeks tended to favor nomos over physis, whilst the aristocratic Greeks tended to favor physis over nomos. In a way, it is comparable to the current debate between the left and the quote-unquote far right. The left tends to emphasize education and the environment, whilst the right tends to emphasize genetics. To quote Coston, The question of what was by nature or by convention animated much of Greek intellectual life and had important political meaning, for example, with the aristocratic party generally favoring the side of nature and the democratic generally favoring the side of convention. The idea of nature was often used to justify aristocratic rule. Aristocrats began arguing that they were entitled to rule by virtue of their nature or pedigree. They noticed that relations between animals were unequal and therefore argued that relations between man should also be unequal. Some went so far to suggest that nature was amoral and therefore man should also be amoral. Critias appears to have believed this, but he was not the only one. Indeed, we find a radical articulation of the same idea in Plato's dialogue, The Gorgias, which we will turn to now. The Gorgias was written in the aftermath of the events that I described a moment ago. When this dialogue was first written, the reign of terror that Critias had unleashed was fresh in the Greek mind. The intellectual climate of Plato's time can, therefore, be compared to our own. In the aftermath of World War II, intellectuals became very reluctant to discuss the social implications of biology and nature. Anyone who discusses the social implications of biology is considered intellectually suspect and is likely to be accused of being a Nazi. According to Koston, Critias was the Hitler of the ancient world. He tried to install a regime that was centrally concerned with biology and eugenics, a regime that was atheistic and totally antagonistic to the democratic idea of equality. He killed the priests and executed many of the democrats, but his regime failed and democracy was eventually reinstated in Athens. In the aftermath of this event, the Athenians became very hostile towards the idea of nature. They began to associate the idea of nature with Critias, much like we associate the idea of biological reductionism with the Nazis. As I said a moment ago, philosophers were centrally concerned with the idea of nature. As a consequence, many of them became politically suspect in the aftermath of the 30 tyrants. Indeed, philosophy itself, the study of nature, came to be associated with tyranny, to quote Coston. 
The ancient prejudice was that philosophy was somehow associated with tyranny as such. Perhaps in the sense that tyrants so often seem to have received part of their education from philosophers. Or perhaps in the sense that both seemed so free, dangerously free, of conventional moral notions and conventional piety, free to the point of criminality. This is part of what made philosophers highly suspect figures, at least when they first appeared. This suspicion led to a wave of persecution. To quote Coston once again, the death of Socrates was not an isolated event. The earlier imprisonment of Anaxagoras, the persecution of Protagoras, the affair of Aristotle later, and so on, are all examples of a general persecution of philosophers taking place around the time of the very birth of philosophy in the Greek world. This ancient prejudice is explicitly expressed in ancient literature. A speech by a Greek statesman from the 4th century says, and I quote, You put to death Socrates, the sophist, fellow citizens, because he was shown to have been the teacher of Critias, one of the 30 tyrants who put down the democracy. In short, philosophers in the ancient world were often persecuted because of their association with tyranny and tyrants. Plato wrote the Gorgias under these conditions. Socrates had been executed alongside many other philosophers. Plato had, therefore, to be extremely cautious about what he wrote. According to Coston, Plato had to adopt a strategy of concealment, a practice of esoteric writing. In other words, his books have a surface meaning and a hidden meaning. The hidden meaning is only apparent to the most careful reader. Now that we have discussed the context in which the Gorgias was written, we are ready to discuss its contents. A moment ago, I mentioned that the Gorgias includes one of the most radical articulations of aristocratic nihilism. This comes from Callicles. The speech that Callicles gives in the Gorgias is one of the most intense and passionate speeches in all of Plato's work. I first read this speech 10 years ago when I was in high school. It was actually the first piece of philosophy that I ever read. In this speech, Callicles defends the idea that might equals right. He also argues that laws and religion are designed by the weak to enslave the strong. He hopes that one day, a man with enough strength will be able to break the bonds of morality and establish natural order. To quote Callicles, For by what manner of right did Xerxes march against Greece, or his father against Scythia? Or take the countless other cases of the sort that one might mention. Why? Surely these men follow nature, the nature of right, in acting thus. Yes, on my soul, they follow the law of nature, and not the laws made by us. We mould the best and strongest amongst us, taking them from their infancy like young lions, and utterly enthrall them by our spells and witchcraft, telling them that they must have but their equal share, and that this is what is fair and just. But, I fancy, when some man arises with enough nature, he shakes off all that we have taught him, bursts his bonds, and breaks free. He tramples underfoot our codes, our charms, and laws, which are all against nature. Our slave rises in revolt, and shows himself our master, and there shines out the full light of the right by nature. From that quote alone, it should be clear why Callicles is often described as the Nietzsche of the ancient world. Callicles hopes that a strong man, a tyrant, can liberate us from convention, custom, and morality, and bring about a return to nature. Like Nietzsche, Callicles believes that morality has been used as a tool by the weak to oppress the strong. He hopes that the superior man can free himself from the stifling conventions of the city and unleash the wild man within. Coston believes that this radical idea was widespread among Greek philosophers. In fact, he believes that Plato and Socrates essentially agreed with Callicles. This might seem strange considering that Socrates disagrees with Callicles throughout this dialogue. He appears to defend conventional morality against the attacks of the extreme and tyrannical Callicles. But you need to remember 
Plato wrote in an esoteric manner to avoid persecution. If Plato did in fact agree with Callicles, he could not openly say so without risking his life. Coston believes that Plato does agree with Callicles, but expresses his agreement in a concealed way that will only be apparent to a close and careful reader. He argues that Socrates' responses to Callicles are so ridiculous and so at odds with what he says in other dialogues that the reader is forced to accept that Socrates and Plato acknowledge what Callicles is saying is true, but are obliged to conceal this because of the political climate that they are living in. To quote Coston, Socrates' replies to Callicles in the Gorgias are weak and inadequate to the point of absurdity. They lack any power to convince anyone reading this text freshly and without an overbearing prejudice in favour of conventional morality. By contrast, the speech that Callicles gives is elegant and persuasive. Therefore, many people who read the Gorgias will conclude that Callicles is correct. This is the effect the dialogue had on me when I first read it over 10 years ago. The dialogue made me question conventional morality. I found what Callicles had to say compelling and began to ask myself, is morality simply a tool used by people to oppress the strong? This, according to Coston, was Plato's intention. He was essentially using the same strategy that dissident writers in the Soviet Union would use thousands of years later. In the Soviet Union, dissidents would present arguments that appeared to be critical of Western ideas, but the ultimate intention was to subtly promote or endorse those very ideas. They would, for example, publish a book that described liberalism in great detail. After describing liberalism, they would then critique it, but the critique would typically be fairly weak and unconvincing. They were allowed to publish this work on liberalism as they appeared to be scrutinizing it. However, beneath the surface, these dissidents were subtly advancing the ideas they claimed to oppose. This, according to Coston, is exactly what Plato was doing. To quote him, Socrates is made to look so moralistic, pedantic, indignant, and ultimately ridiculous that an objective reader might be left thinking that Plato wanted Callicles to have the superior argument. Many other clues led me to believe that the true teaching of Plato is the tyrannical teaching of Callicles, just with makeup on, made polite and presentable for political society. Let's briefly recap what has been said so far. Ancient Greek aristocrats were the first people to discover and articulate the idea of nature. Nature refers to things not made by man. The discovery of nature leads to the birth of philosophy. Indeed, philosophy began as the study of nature. In order to study nature, the philosopher has to disregard tradition. He has to break free from his cultural conditioning. This alienation from tradition enabled the ancient Greek philosopher to look at the world in a totally new way. They rejected religious explanations of natural phenomena and began to view the world in a scientific way. This scientific worldview led to advancements in astronomy, mathematics, physics, medicine, and anatomy. But it also led to a radical new view of politics. As we discussed earlier, Greeks began placing a much greater emphasis on the role of genetics in life. In a number of Greek city-states, eugenic provisions were embraced. Even more radically, some philosophers, such as Callicles, came to totally disregard tradition, religion, and morality. They argued that religion, tradition, and morality had supplanted the natural order. Callicles hoped that a tyrant would rise up and bring about a return to nature. Coston argues that this view was widespread among philosophers. That is why they were persecuted by the democratic Athenians. He believes that Socrates was ultimately executed because of his association with tyranny and tyrants. But this association goes beyond Socrates. Indeed, philosophy itself was associated with tyranny in the ancient world. To quote Coston, Philosophers and tyrants were both perceived by the cities of the time as kindred criminal spirits. Philosophers were attacked as teachers of tyranny, tyrants lickspittles or companions, associates of tyrants. In his work, 
Plato managed to successfully deny this association. Today, most people believe that Socrates was executed for simply questioning the religious beliefs of the Athenians. They do not know about his association with tyranny. In this section, I am going to outline that association. We have already mentioned Critias, who led an uprising against the democracy in 404 BC with the help of Sparta. He murdered the priests and executed his democratic rivals. He was a political philosopher and a student of Socrates. This was not an isolated event. Indeed, many of the men that Socrates associated with appear to have been sympathetic towards Sparta. They adopted Spartan dress and manners. In Aristophanes' comedy, The Birds, Socrates is portrayed as the idol of the pro-Spartan faction within Athens. Indeed, Aristophanes describes the followers of Socrates as Sparta mad. To quote him, Sparta mad they went, long-haired, half-starved, unwashed, Socratified, with side tails in their hands. In the 5th century BC, aristocratic Athenians would advertise their political sympathies by adopting Spartan tastes. The followers of Socrates wore their hair long in the Spartan fashion. They avoided refinement in dress, manners, and appearance. They carried around side tails, which was a short club or cudgel that Spartans carried. This suggests that they were sympathetic towards Sparta. Many of his followers participated in the events of both 411 BC and 404 BC. With almost no exception, they were always against the democracy. Many of his followers fled to Sparta after the democracy was restored. Alcibiades was a student of Socrates. Like Critias, he appears to have been an atheist. One night, whilst drunk with a group of friends in Athens, he desecrated religious icons throughout the city. He was accused of having vandalized statues of Hermes with his drunken friends. He chose to flee to Sparta instead of standing trial in Athens. In 411 BC, Alcibiades initiated a coup against the Athenian democracy. Xenophon was another student of Socrates. Alongside Plato, he is one of the main authorities on the life of Socrates. According to Xenophon, Socrates believed that it is the business of the ruler to give orders and of the ruled to obey. Xenophon was eventually exiled from Athens and spent the rest of his life in Sparta, where he served as a military leader. Plato himself greatly admired Sparta. Indeed, the utopia that he described in the Republic is based on Sparta. We have already mentioned the fact that Sparta embraced tough eugenic provisions. Plato appears to have greatly admired these provisions, in the Republic, he talks about breeding human beings as one breeds animals. He believed that procreation should be strictly regulated by the state. To quote him, The best men should cohabit with the best women in as many cases as possible, and the worst with the worst in the fewest, if the flock is to be as perfect as possible. Socrates was an outspoken critic of democracy. He admired the Spartan constitution and way of life. Aristophanes describes his followers as Sparta mad, because they dressed and lived like Spartans. Two of his students, Alcibiades and Critias, played an instrumental role in overthrowing the democracy, and many of his followers served as aristocratic stormtroopers in 411 BC and 404 BC. His most famous student, Plato, based his utopia on Sparta, and later on in his life, Plato himself would teach and work with tyrants in Syracuse. All of this seems to suggest that there was a link between philosophy and tyranny in the ancient world. Men who studied at the feet of Socrates went on to overthrow the democracy, not once but twice. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned the important role that aristocratic clubs played in Athenian politics. Plans to overthrow the democracy often began in these clubs. The followers of Socrates were overwhelmingly aristocratic. This begs the question, were the philosophical clubs of antiquity secretly conspiring to seize power and install a philosopher king? Coston appears to think so. I will now try and summarize what has been said throughout this video as succinctly as I possibly can. Coston believes that the esoteric project of philosophy is the rebarbarization of the superior man. In other words, 
Philosophy attempts to show the superior man that nomos, convention, and morality are false. Moral laws vary depending on where someone is. They are not, therefore, true. They are simply the opinion of the masses within that given nation or territory. Through the practice of philosophy, the superior man can come to realize that these moral laws are not, in fact, true. That they vary from place to place because they are not natural. Through philosophy, the superior man can therefore free himself from the stifling conventions of morality. He can realize that the things that men hold the most sacred are, in fact, lies. Once the superior man has liberated himself from convention, he is ready to return to nature. And in nature, the strong dominate. The philosophical schools help liberate the superior man from convention, not only in theory, but in practice. Throughout history, philosophical schools have often secretly conspired against the government. They have secretly planned to seize power and install a philosopher king. Once the philosopher king is installed, he attempts to breed a new type of man. I am in no position to evaluate the historical accuracy of this claim. I simply don't know enough about the topic. But I do know that this book can give us an insight into how Costin sees himself. It is no secret that Costin is Bronze Age pervert. His 2018 book, Bronze Age Mindset, appealed to the young. It ridiculed the stifling egalitarianism of our age, and it encouraged young men to join the military and intel agencies. It should be clear that BAP, like the philosophers of antiquity, seeks to return to nature. For this, he is being denounced as a corrupter of the youth. Thanks for watching.